What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Core Consult RX Podcast. Already messed it up, Cole. See that? Can't even say pod, the word podcast today. How many episodes have we done and we can't remember our name? <laughs> Too many to not be able to remember our name, but <laughs> hey, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. It's uh, Tuesday. It is Tuesday. Can't even say it's Monday. Right. No excuses. No. But um, to tried. be fair, we haven't actually been behind the mic, or at least for the four podcasts in like, what, a couple weeks now? Mm-hmm. That's lot, true. We forgot everything. On. So much. I took a vacation. You did? I, know, I knew you'd be upset at me about that, but I did it anyway. I, I, I've, I'm starting to recover from my anger. You did a little thing? I did. Uh, my son was born. Yes. Um, he decided to show up seven weeks early, which was fantastic. Um, little surprise on 4th of July. Yeah. He, so he gets to decide? Yeah, was, he sure that does. That his timing, so yeah. he was ready to go. So he's, yep, he's uh, in the NICU still, getting better and getting ready to uh, hopefully come home too in a couple weeks. Congratulations. But, uh, thank you, man. Can you believe that when we started this, I don't think was I even married then? Maybe no. maybe engaged. No, no, no. You, I don't think so. Yeah. Maybe maybe just dating actually. Yeah, probably. Now I've got a kid. You got a kid. Now look at you, third uh, marriage. <laughs> why are they letting us have kids? I don't know. <laughs> what are they thinking? <laughs> That's what I've been saying that for a minute, but I'm like I don't know. Dogs are barking too. This is off to a great start. I know you got kids, dogs, and snakes. It's unbelievable. It's chaos here. <laughs> Anarchy while we're trying to record a podcast. <laughs> But um, we have our little quantum of solace in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the good thing is, uh, this is an accredited episode. It is. So despite off to a rough start, hopefully you get some credit for this. So you, it's worth your time, and uh, you know, even little annoyances along the way will be worth it. Um, so once again, uh, thanks to FreeCE.com. Uh, we've partnered with them uh, to basically when provide this continuing education, um, ACPE accredited, uh, one hour of CE credit that you can get um, if you are an unlimited member of their platform. Listen to this episode and then use the code P-U-L-M. HTN, so like pulmonary hypertension, was what that stands for, for those of you at home listening, and uh, and use that, it's all caps, put that code in, um, the link to actually get to the, the various podcast episodes um, will be in the show notes, so click on the, the episode that you listen to, hope in this one in this case, and uh, you'll get a 10 question multiple choice uh, quiz that you will easily pass, and then you will get your credit. Um, but, uh, thanks to them, uh, once again, for partnering with us, we, we definitely appreciate it. We're having fun with these continuing ed ones, long, a little bit longer episodes and we are. So, uh, make sure you check that out. If you're not an unlimited member, definitely look at all the different things they have available on their website. Besides us, obviously check our stuff out first, then look at all the, the monographs, the lives, we're, we're number one live session. Right. And of, then look at them. Then look at them. <laughs> they're, 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 uh, no, they actually have some awesome content. That's probably way better than anything we've been making. So, um, definitely check it out. And there's a, um, a discount code as well for their unlimited membership. So if you're not an unlimited member, check that out. And thanks to freece.com. So cool. I already kind of gave it away with the uh, did. with the the code there, but spoiler alert. Yep. We're talking about pulmonary hypertension. We're going to focus on pulmonary arterial hypertension and we'll um, we'll uh, kind of specify why I said that uh, in a second. It's been years since we've talked about this at all. So um, some developments, a lot of drugs in this one, so buckle your seatbelts. Before we start, I did want to give a little bit of the history of this um, uh, maybe relatively newly um, uh, recognized disease state. So the first case was reported in 1891. German doctor, of course, Dr. Romberg, published a study of a patient on autopsy. He had thickening of the pulmonary artery without, hung, without heart or lung disease that might have caused it. So then he thought there must be something else going on here. It wasn't until 1950 that three cases were reported by a Dr. Dresdel in the U.S. Uh, he initially called it primary pulmonary hypertension, that's no longer used. They just call it pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's been linked, some of you might remember, I'm a little bit too young for this. Um, it's been linked to some diet drugs that you might recognize. Fen-Fen, mm -hmm. remember that? Uh, Pondamin and Redux. So these are all basically, Fen-Fen is, um, is a fenfluramine with Fentermine. And that was a drug that came out uh, back in the 70s or something like that for diet. Um, turns out that it was causing valvular heart issues, um, pulmonary hypertension, people were dying, huge lawsuits. It was mainly related to the fenfluramine. Yeah. That was the, the fen part of the fen fen. I yes. guess the F-E-N part of the yes. fen fen. Then Pondamin, which was, which was just the brand name for plain fenfluramine, and then Redux, which was dex fenfluramine. 
So there was a lot of lawsuits. They took it off the market in like 1997 as a whole thing. And then, of course, Fentermine ended up uh, making it uh, continuing on by itself. So it comes off, dangerous drug. Turns out, I didn't realize this, came back on the market, branded by a different uh, company as Fentepla. Hmm. Fenflurmi, you ever heard of that? Mm-mm. Turns out I have because <laughs> it, was, it came back on the market and it's used for epilepsy, mm. of all things. Um, specifically in 2020, it was approved for Dravet syndrome related uh. epilepsy. So I had seen it a couple times in my world. Um, and then in March, 2022, just recently, it got a new indication for Lennox Gastaut syndrome, which is a more common form of refractory mm. epilepsy. So I started to see it more. Uh, and I did not, and I fin because when I saw it with the fin fin thing, I recognized it, hmm. uh, but did not realize that it's this old diet drug that's weird so, I, I mean are, is it different strength or is, is, how are they avoiding it is different strength but the, the there's still the risk so it's got a box warning okay. for valvular heart defects pulmonary hypertension um, and has a REMS program mm. for that too but the mechanism is interesting it acts on 5-HT2B mm-hmm. serotonin receptors and agonists don't know how it works for epilepsy but it turns out it does yeah interesting huh? yeah that's really interesting so I, I saw I saw fenfluramine and started looking into it boom something that I kind of see a little bit in my world how often are you actually seeing that given to people uh it's probably six times okay but it's so probably more it's just yeah, it yeah. doesn't always cross my path because um, we like can't fill, pretty, our pharmacy can't fill it it's limited distribution but I feel like that's a pretty rough I mean with that box one if you have yeah the next guest I mean I think you could wouldn't you just go with on fee or <laughs> yeah well you know, I mean because they, they I guess it they've and tried it and it doesn't work hmm. yeah so I mean there's a, a drug that has that we dispense that has another rims program called Vigabatrin for per- blindness, mm. eye damage, and permanent blindness. Um, it's for infantile spasms and things, but sometimes for refractory epilepsy, and that usually they've tried Onfi and all the things. Yeah, so, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. If you just All you need now is a little bit of fentramine, and you can have fenfen again. I know. Man, it's back. <laughs> it wasn't very effective in the first place. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, it turns out there's way better stuff to lose weight. But the reason I mentioned that is because it can. it is a drug that can lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension so the world health organization it has we we usually think of pah as for people who are familiar as the umbrella term but it's really not it's a part of the grouping of the world health organization's classifications of um, pulmonary hypertension that's the umbrella term so pah pulmonary arterial hypertension is group one there's group two which is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease uh, group three, which is pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases and or hypoxia. Uh, group four, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, um, abbreviated as CTEPH. And then group five, pulmonary hypertension that is unclear or uh, has multifactorial mechanisms. So all those groups, we're going to be focusing um, pretty much exclusively on PAH throughout this. It's the one with the most um, pharmacotherapy involved, right? Yeah. And, and the other ones kind of are more so dealing with the actual underlying condition itself, which we've have episodes on a lot of those different situations as well, whether it be COPD or heart failure. So yeah, the pH is probably the one that's more useful from a pharmacology standpoint, just because they're, some of the drugs are really only utilized in this setting, you know, for the most part. So as far as some of the causes uh, that can, and, and reasons why a patient could develop or at least be at risk for developing, um, you know, pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, it could be idiopathic for one. Um, there's also a genetic component as well. So there's been several mutations that can be, um, that can be seen from a pharmacogenomic standpoint, um, a genetic standpoint that have been kind of um, determined to increase the, the likelihood of developing this. Um, certain drugs, toxins that a patient could be exposed to, um, it can induce pulmonary arterial hypertension, kind of like Cole was saying. And then uh, there's also pulmonary arterial hypertension that's associated with various other comorbidities. So connective tissue diseases, HIV infection, um, portal hypertension, congenital heart diseases, things like that. Um, and then there's also a, a component that could be uh, from a pulmonary veno-occlusive disease or um, a pulmonary capillary hema- uh, hemoangiomatosis standpoint, which can also be idiopathic or um, genetic, drug-induced, all that good stuff. Um, there's persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn as well that can eventually turn into pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
And so lots and lots of different uh, things that can eventually lead the, a patient down this path. Now for group two, which just to kind of give you some differences, um, group two, like Cole said, is the pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. That's typically going to be associated with left ventricular systolic or diastolic dysfunction, valvular disease, things of that nature. Um, the pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases and or hypoxia, which is group three, COPD, interstitial lung disease, um, you know, other types of like obstructive pattern pulmonary diseases, sleep uh, disorder, breathing, um, chronic exposure to high altitude, things like that. Um, and then for group four, uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, um, other types of things that can cause pulmonary artery obstructions like uh, angiosarcoma, um, congenital issues like um, pulmonary arteries, uh, artery stenosis, things like that, parasites even. Um, and then group five obviously can be a whole bunch of different things. Um, Langerhans cell, histocytosis. I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of things that can yeah. be going on. Um, so it gives you an idea. But again, because we're focusing on, on group one, uh, it is a good idea just to get some of the uh, things that can lead a patient um, to this. Because if there is some underlying thing that we can kind of minimize the exposure to a risk of, you know, we can definitely go that route. But a lot of times, once the damage is started, you know, we're kind of just um, keeping the patient stable at that point. Right. And it is a very serious condition. Mm -hmm. I'm also already tired of saying pulmonary arterial hypertension. PAH. I'm going to call it PAH for the rest of the time. So there I'm you just go. warning everybody. That, that's off the table now. It's, so it's, nobody it's, complain. It's out there. Um, yeah, it's, it's very serious. It's a progressive um, vasoconstriction of the small pulmonary arteries. Uh, it leads to right ventricular hypertrophy and failure. So that's ultimately the, the kind of end, end issue that we run into. Uh, it occurs uh, in this situation because of an imbalance in um, endothelial vasoconstrictors like thromboxane and endothelin-1 um, compared to or versus vasodilators like prostacyclin and nitric, nitric oxide. So you're going to see a lot of the drugs we talk about uh, may act on those, either blocking the vasoconstrictors or potentiating the vasodilators. Um, pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary artery pressure will increase over time. There's a risk for thrombosis. So there's an increased levels of von Willebrand factor, um, plasma fibrinopeptide A, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, um, 5-HT, so, so things that may increase risk for thrombosis. Um, as far as the lab tests to look for, it's defined as a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, and that's at rest. Uh, a pulmonary wedge pressure or a left ventricular in diastolic pressure less than 15 millimeters of mercury uh, and pulmonary vascular resistance greater than three wood units measured by a right cardiac cath. Yeah, so you would get a right cardiac cath for all of these things to establish these, Yep. Um, which is um, obviously going to be done in a very uh, specialized environment. Um, so Cole kind of walked through uh, a lot of the um, patho or some of the patho already but again like he was saying um, a lot of it comes down to pulmonary vascular constriction and damage and from a genetic standpoint you know those things there can be those mutations that can lead to more likelihood of uh, presence of more um, vasoconstrictors and vasodilators and then other risk factors like we've already talked about can kind of worsen that vascular damage and so everything from the, the platelets changes, the inflammatory activation, endothelial dysfunction, all that good stuff will kind of cause all those things that Cole was kind of mentioning and um, lead to that pulmonary hypertension. And that can eventually lead into the, the right heart dysfunction and then eventually failure as well. Um, so as far as like the, the diagnostic kind of process it's it's really involved and like cole was saying this is a very specialized disease state um to where it oftentimes will start from cardiology and pulmonology and you know kind of then progress to an actual institution that is or a center that has you know known for its expertise in pulmonary hypertension specifically. with the guidelines they even specifically mentioned yeah. to be managed at one of those places most of the time right absolutely and so they'll get uh an, an echo um echocardiograph um, evaluation of a patient who's suspected of having, you know, pulmonary hypertension. And um, then from there, if it's low probability, you know, you're looking for other causes of high probability, that's going to lead you down, obviously, the some of the other diagnostic assessments um, that need to be done to anything from echocardiogram to um, can you can chest imaging there could be uh, arterial blood gas um, pulmonary function tests right heart cath like we had talked about and hopefully that can give us a little bit of an idea of what's actually causing the 
under like, like the umbrella term, like calls it pulmonary arterial or excuse me, pulmonary hypertension. And then from there, we're kind of establishing which group that they would fall into based on, you know, the, the performing those right heart cath, um, wedge pressures and all that stuff. And then, um, from there, uh, you know, some other things we can look at looking for comorbidities and things that can worsen it, um, to eventually end up with either saying yes, pulmonary arterial hypertension group one, or if we're still not sure at the end of the day, they'll lump them into group five, which is kind of the miscellaneous. So uh, the diagnostic process is a very long and convoluted process that is not something that's done in like a visit. It's right. usually over the course of a while and the person's transferred over to a, a center. Right. And you don't take the blood pressure and diagnose them with hypertension. You, you know sure I mean? don't. It's I mean, you easy. could, it's not but that it's probably going to be wrong. Right. <laughs> Um, so kind of similar to heart failure, um, there are functional class, um, classifications, uh, descriptions that will guide therapy. And so as we go through the medications and, um, therapeutic options, you'll hear us reference these functional classes. Uh, it's one, two, three, and four. Um, so functional class one is going to be the least amount of limitation Four is going to be the most. So one would be a patient where there's no limitation in their usual physical activity, um, it doesn't cause dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain. Everything's virtually normal, but they still have uh, PAH. Um, World Health Organization Functional Class 2 would be patients with mild limitation of physical activity. They don't have discomfort at rest, but normal physical activity is going to cause the symptoms of dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain. They might feel faint. Class 3 is going to be marked limitation of physical activity. Still no discomfort at, at rest, um, but less than normal physical activity is going to cause those symptoms. And then four is the highest. That's going to be patients who are unable to perform any physical activity at rest. Um, they may have signs of right ventricular failure. Uh, they're going to be, have the symptoms at rest more than likely. Um, and they may be placed in this category if they experience a um, fainting episode, an episode of syncope as well. All right. So you have a patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension, been diagnosed, they're at an expert center. Um, some of the non-pharmacological lifestyle things that will be kind of talked to the patient, discussed with the patient, um, involve uh, things like keeping a, a daily um, log of a patient's weights, uh, you know, body weight as far as like fluid retention and all that good stuff, as well as just overall symptoms, how they're feeling, breathlessness, things like that. Um, some dietary uh, restrictions would involve mostly sodium restrictions and then uh, potentially uh, limiting the fluid intake. Um, and then also considering getting the patient enrolled in some sort of a rehabilitation exercise training PT program that is specifically, you know, made and catered, catered towards a patient that's dealing with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So more, much more of a specialized uh, rehab center and um, with, you know, PTs that have very specialized training in this condition specifically. So, um, there are multiple studies that have showed that this can definitely help. Um, these are the type of training would be like low level aerobic exercises, like walking, things like that. Um, so not anything too strenuous, but it basically overall it can improve the physical activity, the functional capacity and, and the overall quality of life, which is a big one for people suffering from this disease. Um, but again, it needs to be done at a specialized center if possible. Yeah. Um, immunizations, obviously those are, you know, the Prevnar 20s, the flu shot every year, um, the Tdap, if they haven't had that and uh, COVID vaccine, if they haven't had that, just the standard vaccines on top of the other ones that would be recommended by the ACIP. But if, you know, obviously if, if they're limited on which ones they are willing to take, the respiratory ones would be the, probably the most important to go after in my opinion. Um, and then the issue of pregnancy There's not all these patients are elderly. Like we would think about with, you know, heart failure or something like that. There's plenty of patients who are still very much of childbearing age. that get diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension or PAH is, I forgot we were doing the acronym. Yeah. No, no what more. Am I, what am I doing? <laughs> um, and so because of that, uh, it is important to talk to patients about the dangers of, you know, becoming pregnant with this disease because 30 to 50% of patients that become pregnant, um, can, and, uh, have, you know, can basically die from the pregnancy and complications of that. This is crazy. 30, 50% maternal mortality rate. That's crazy. Super, super high. So obviously that's going to be a conversation that the patient needs to be aware of and, and understand the risks as they, you know, need to be aware of what, what could happen if they do decide to go forward with that. And then also if not, they need to be consulted on potential, um, contraception options that are yeah. available and what they can do to avoid that. Yeah. We'll reference it later, but basically two forms, 
Yeah. Basically two forms. Basically two forms. There you go, Cole. I guess we already talked about it. There you- <laughs> no need to mention it again. Don't even think about bringing it up. Um, <laughs> I, I will forget that I mentioned it, and I will bring it up in about 30 minutes. Okay. See you then. Um, but uh, also encouraging patients to um, avoiding high-altitude situations like plane rides, stuff like that, if possible. Um, and if not, then bringing supplemental oxygen, especially if you're going hiking in the, the Rockies. Probably not doing that, but um, I almost made a joke, but I decided not to. But it reminds me of and that. I did, and I beat you to it. No, no, you watch The Office. The Office, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of that episode when Michael is moving to what is it, Colorado, with Holly, and it's a you know higher altitude, and so um, he's sitting up on the roof of the office building, and Pam goes up and asks what he's doing. He says he's preparing for the altitude. Heck yeah, it's great. That's what I think of when I hear anything about high altitude. I realized like. You know, one, I'm getting older and I'm also out of shape when I went to Colorado last mm-hmm. and actually was trying to move, just just exist, you know, from like my door to <laughs> just like, live life just, in just Colorado. walk around. And I was like huffing and puffing and I was like, oh man, the air is much <laughs> thinner. They weren't joking about this high altitude thing. It was rough. I was you like, see those videos about people in the South commenting, uh, you know, about the heat in Arizona being 110 and, and everybody in the South has to respond with, yeah, but that's a dry heat. Yeah, yeah it's true. It's, it's really the humidity that uh-huh. gets you. Uh, Matt, would you try living in Colorado when you literally can't breathe because uh, of the altitude? Terrible. I'd be in a, yeah, constant state I'd of I'd take the humidity anxiety. over the not being able to breathe. I asked some guy. At least, be, you, well, though, at least you get used to that. See, yeah, that's what it I is thought. The, then humidity is worse. That's Never what mind. I thought because I asked the dude, uh, I was, we were sharing a gondola ride up in Brickendridge. I was like, yo. That you, was like the most hoity-toity thing you've ever said. Yeah, Say yeah, that boy. sentence again. Don't worry about it. We were snowboarding. <laughs> we were we were looking really cool and snowboarding. We weren't. That? I don't know what I was talking. Anyway, we <laughs> we were not at Breckenridge. We were this really cool snowboarding park or whatever. Anyways, um, <laughs> you say hoity toity. Don't ever say that. No, it's bougie. We'll call it bougie. <laughs> and it was my wife's fault. She was pregnant. She wanted to go we're snowboarding. A gondola ride up the Breckenridge. That's that's how they get you up the mountain. Any, we are way off topic, people. I'm sorry. This is Cole's fault. Um, and I asked the guy who was riding with us, who's a local. I was like, Hey, is how long? How long does it take you to get used to the air? He goes, Dude, I still can't breathe. I've been here for two years. Oh gosh. I was like, Oh, never mind. Okay. So, Maybe it wins then. Yeah. I don't know. I hate the humidity too, though. I know. Just move to somewhere where it's nice weather. How about that? And you can breathe. Where Anyways, we'll keep it in our back pocket. Yeah, I don't know. Supportive therapy, Cole. Yeah. What do we got? Yes. So, supportive therapy for PAH. Um, you can use a few things. Oxygen therapy can be administered um, to, to PAH patients with rex, resting, exercise-induced, or nocturnal hypoxemia, so it can help with the, the low oxygen. Um, data to support the value of it in PAH patients are generally taken from patients who have hypoxemia from COPD, so there's not a lot of solid data around it, but it's definitely done. Um, anticoagulation is usually avoided, so even though there's this uh, increased risk for thrombosis and things like that, it's generally avoided, but evaluate the need on a case-by-case basis. Diuretics, specifically loop diuretics, can be used in patients with uh, chronic fluid retention, um, it's mainly related to the, um, right ventricular, um, failure and they could benefit cause they're holding some extra fluid like with heart failure. All right. So let's get on to the actual treatments to, to basically slow the disease progression and maintain the patient, um, for specifically the disease. Now, some patients will, um, react to what they call vasoreactivity testing. Um, So if you have a patient that is a candidate for this, uh, and then it's a very low amount of, uh, or low percentage of patients that are actually going to respond to this vasoreactivity testing. Uh, It's like 10, 20% of patients. If they do respond though, you have the option of treating them with a calcium channel blocker as first line therapy until basically it no longer works. Um, Which is a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, So patients who have idiopathic uh, PAH or um, genetic um, or drug-induced are the ones that are most likely going to respond. And uh, some contraindications to even doing the vasoreactivity testing include a low systemic um, blood pressure, so systolic BP of less than 90, basically, a low cardiac index of less than 2, um, a presence of severe, like basically functional class 4 symptoms, uh, which would be needing to escalate therapy quite quickly. 
Uh, and if you do decide that a patient's a candidate, there's three pharmacological options that you can choose from. There's inhaled nitric oxide, and uh, there is ipoprosenol, um, and then des- adenosine. All three are available, and they all have their um, different, you know, op- adverse effects associated with them and whatnot. Um, the inhaled nitric oxide option is the one that um, has the least amount of concern for like systemic side effects and things like that. So if you have a patient who's got a lot of other comorbidities, that may be a good option. But a lot of times it's probably going to be whatever is on, you know, not formulary, but on pro- right. protocol for the center. Right. Doesn't sound like any specific ones preferred. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not that I've seen. So the guidelines have some recommendations um, for these newly um, diagnosed or suspected PAH patients. If you suspect that that's the issue, they do recommend that they're evaluated at a um, pulmonary hypertension center. A lot of these recommendations are not necessarily evidence-based. It's more of um, expert consensus. Um, once they confirm the diagnosis of PAH, evaluate the severity in a systematic and consistent manner, coordinate care between the physicians and the pulmonary hypertension center, um, treat the contributing causes aggressively, um, incorporate palliative care if needed. Um, like I said, this is a pretty serious condition. Um, so there's a number of things that they go through, um, some of which we've already mentioned. Yeah, they say avoid non-essential surgery when surgery um, is necessary. They suggest doing it at a pulmonary hypertension center. Ultimately, that leads to you doing what Mike talked about, the vasoreactivity testing. If it's positive, we can treat with the calcium channel blocker. But if it's negative or if they have right um, ventricular failure or contraindication to a calcium channel blocker, then they should, of course, not use that. So that's summarizing all that junk all together to basically get to the point of selecting the calcium channel blocker for the few patients who will um, benefit from it. And the three that are recommended are either amlodipine, nifedipine ER, or diltiazem. And the doses are what throws people off a little bit when they have a patient who is being treated for this. So amlodipine, the, the kind of recommended dosing for PAH is 20 to 30 milligrams per day. It's very different than seeing like a the 10 milligrams max. Yeah. yeah, You'll definitely get a notification on your drug, what, drug interaction check, your DUR yeah. check. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Um, nifedipine ER, the doses range between 120 and 240 milligrams per day, and DILT would be the uh, 240 to 720 milligrams per day. Um, and, and the adverse effects are, we're all familiar with these, but basically with the dihydros like the amlodipine, um, philodipine, or nifedipine, um, peripheral edema is the big one, um, as, long as, uh, as well as dizziness, hypotension, all that good stuff that we have with anything that can lower blood pressure potentially. And then the non dihydro specifically, diltiazem in this case, uh, we have to worry more so on the uh, side of like bradycardia and constipation, things like that as well. Um, now, diltiazem is the one that is preferred um, and not verapamil, um, and it's especially if the patient has like some concomitant tachycardia, because basically verapamil um, is a more potent negative inotropic uh, or inotrope. So they do recommend diltiazem specifically, um, and especially over like the other two options, the the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker options, if the patient has concomitant t- uh, tachycardia. Um, now, even if a patient responds to the the vasoreactivity testing they're on a calcium channel blocker don't get comfortable with the treatment though and be realistic with the patient because uh, even those patients who do respond which is like i said only 10 20 percent of patients um, a very small number of those patients will actually still be responding to the calcium channel blocker by the one year mark so it's it's a limited time thing but it keeps them off the more intense meds yeah more affordable yeah less side effects yep yeah so um We'll move on to advanced therapies. That's going to be the next step. Advanced therapies are used when patients, um, if they are not a vasoreactive responder at all, or they're no longer, like Mike mentioned, or if there's not improvement in their Mm -hmm. functional class, or if it worsens. So endothelin receptor antagonists are going to be the first first class that we talk about. There's three, bocentan. uh, It's a twice-daily dual EP1 and EP2 antagonist. Also, ambrosentan, it's a once-daily selective for the EP1. And then masatentan, it's once-daily, acts the same as bosentan, a dual EP1 and EP2 antagonist. Uh, They decrease endogenous vasoconstrictors, um, so they're going to promote vasodilation. EP1 is a peptide that's a potent vasoconstrictor for the smooth muscle. It interacts with the ETA and or the ETB endothelial receptors. 
So what these end up doing is improving exercise capacity, so improving symptoms, um, overall hemodynamics, and then hopefully improving functional class. This is what they've been shown to do. And they all have a REMS program uh, related to pregnancy. Uh, but that's just an overview, and then we'll get into them specifically. Yeah. So um, Bocentan is uh, for functional class two, three, four, potentially, and usually used in combination. All of these are going to be essentially common, um, combination therapies, ideally. Uh, the adverse effects that are more associated with this one in particular would be the hepatotoxicity risk, so increased LFTs, um, as well as increased total bilirubin, um, anemia risk, um, syncope, nasal congestion, palpitations, peripheral edema. Um, it also uh, does have, um, you know, the some monitoring parameters that we need to be aware of. So specifically, the, the LFTs are a big one um, because if we do start titrating that dose up to the kind of the recommended dosing um, and, the, and, and the LFTs go up by three to five times the upper limit of normal, we, after we've titrated them up, we need to start um, reducing that, that dose and not using that target dose anymore. And we also need to monitor the CBC uh, every three months to assess for the presence of anemia. Um, peripheral edema is though the most common uh, adverse effect that patients will complain about and like Cole was saying those rim, that REMS program is associated with the, the contraindication of pregnancy so old school pregnancy categories that would be considered an X yep I feel like we still use those I, I definitely I 100% especially at least for, for X. X at yeah. least for yep. X that's the only time I use it but it's definitely I definitely still say that all the time at least for X yep and I'm not changing <laughs> <laughs> we're already like old practitioners yep right? we've been practicing for 20 my day we had categories for this kind of thing it's funny that we always use a southern accent I'm sure it's because we're in the south what do what do people in the north and midwest do when they make when they, uh, they probably make a southern you, you they probably still do a southern accent they think we all sound like that <laughs> yeah um the next is ambrosentan the brand name is Lateris. uh so it's functional class two three and four just like um the other Selective for the ETA receptor, like I said, to antagonize that. It's 5 milligrams once a day. Has a max of 10 milligrams once a day. Adverse effects, similar, peripheral edema, nasal congestion, flushing, anemia, palpitations, uh, still pregnancy category X. But it doesn't have the increase in LFTs. At least studies haven't shown that it has a significant increase in LFTs like with Bosentam. So the once daily dosing is convenient. Um, the, the no increase in LFTs is, is convenient there, I'd say. And then the uh, Masatentan is one that uh, is the dual um, ETA, ETB antagonist. Same, all, the, all three of those functional classes, and it's a 10 milligrams once daily dosing. Um, there was a landmark trial that was done with it called the Seraphin trial. And um, over a three-month period, when you add this uh, either at 3 or 10 milligrams daily, and patients could be on other treatments, uh, with the exception of some of the sub-Q or IV prostacyclins, um, patients had a, dem- uh, a statistically significant decrease in the composite endpoint of events that were related to PAH or death compared to placebo. Um, still pregnancy category X, you know, yep. just like the others. I'll say... Um that my th- these would generally be considered specialty medications so my group works um with PAH I don't specifically I definitely have heard of more bosentan and ambrosentan versus masatentan mm-hmm. so do with that what you will uh then we have uh, a, a class of medication that you've definitely heard of phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors um, brand, branded differently for PAH that we can use as well. So there's sildenafil and tadalafil. Sildenafil's branded as Revatio. That's how you pronounce it, right? Yep, I believe so. Revatio. Um, and then add Circa for tadalafil. So not the um, not what you're Viagra used to. Not Viagra and Cialis, yes. Um, with sildenafil, um, it increases intracellular CGMP, leading to vasorelaxation, kind of the same um, mechanism of, of what we use it for um, otherwise for ED. Uh, it's FDA approved dose is 20 milligrams three times a day, uh, but higher doses are frequently used for PAH. Uh, it can cause headaches, flushing, dyspepsia, changes in vision. Uh, it does have an interaction with Bosentan, that's with 3A4, um, and uh, that decreases sildenafil concentrations by 50%, so it does need adjustment. Mm-hmm. Um, Tadalafil, dosing 40 milligrams once a day, it also interacts with Bosentan via 3A4. And it has greater improvements with exercise capacity and even time to clinical worsening, uh, which was not shown with sildenafil. Yeah. And the the needs adjustment specifically because sildenafil and bocentin are evidence-based. Like, they've had some studies with that combo. You just have to tweak the doses. Right. Um, 
All right, so another class, guanylate cyclase stimulant. Um, so for those of you who listened to our heart failure update lecture, uh, or not lecture, but you know what I'm saying, podcast episode, not a lecture. Let's get that straight. <laughs> um, but you may have heard of... We do that on Patreon. Yeah, that's on Patreon. That's on Patreon. You can find that right now on Patreon. <laughs> it's a good plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the uh, you may have remembered us talking about Varicigawatt, which is another drug that's been approved for um, decreasing hospitalizations for HEFREF. But this is actually in the same class that's been... A, around for quite a while beforehand. It's called Rhea Sigawatt. Um, it works the same way. It's going to stimulate the nitric oxide receptor and um, increase the sensitivity of soluble guanylate cyclase to endogenous nitric oxide. Um, so it's in, it also can work uh, synergistically with nitric oxide to stimulate that guanylate cyclase as well. Uh, it's it's dosed three times a day, and there's a titration schedule that you have to follow. Um, you can be take it with or without food; it doesn't um, really matter. Um, the main adverse effects that people complain about is syncope and hypotension. Um, it can also cause a little bit of dyspepsia, peripheral edema, and some GI upset. Now, one thing that to keep in mind, especially when we start talking about combo options, there's because there's a whole bunch that have been studied. Um, it is contraindicated to be used with a PDE5 because of the risk of severe hypotension. Yep. Think of it like a nitrate only, just not don't call it a nitrate. Right. But I mean, um, it's same concept. Stimulates nitric oxide. So. Yeah. But yeah. I just don't want anybody quoting us wrong. <laughs> yes. Before I'm sure get, they do all the time. Oh, well, we probably quote ourselves wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> we give the wrong quotes. Yeah, you go. we give you guys wrong quotes to tell each other. Um, can you imagine? <laughs> and that's a, good, that's a good thing to put on iTunes. What if uh, we went a totally section? different direction and just at some point we started to give completely wrong information on purpose? I feel like, I feel like we would be uh, in some trouble. With That'd be pretty bad, right? <laughs> that would be pretty bad since we're talking about medicine. That would be better when we're talking about like, collectibles yeah. or something else stupid when we start a new podcast. Things that don't matter. That no one ever listens to. Yeah. Pregnancy category X. We're still talking about Rhea Sigawa for those of you who are like, God, now we're off topic again. Yeah, I know. we're sorry. Two forms of contraception needs to be used, and then it needs to also be continued even for um, the first month after stopping Rhea Sigawa if you know, a patient could become pregnant. Um, if a patient is smoking, hopefully we are really encouraging them to stop um, at this point. But if they are smoking, you will need larger doses than normal um, when on this drug because of interaction with um, nicotine. Um, it's a in smoking tobacco basically um, is a one a sip one a two um, interaction, and it'll cause the. Uh, you'll get lower um, drug concentrations um, because of smoking cigarettes uh, effects on um, on 1A2. And, you know, if, if you're like, well, what other things could induce the SIP 450 1A2? Pull up your Pearls app, um, our sponsor uh, for the podcast. So we'll do a Pearl of the, of the day, if you will. Um, they have a nice little chart with some very commonly used medications that are SIP 450 enzyme inducers, and they have another one for in inhibitors. And if you look on 1A2, first one listed um, is the, the 1A2 drugs. And if you look at the very bottom, tobacco is, is listed there very prominently. Um, rifampin, carbamazepine, some others as well. Uh, but if you have not checked out that app yet it's pearls p-y-r-l-s dot com slash core consult rx and you can sign up for a free membership um, and register your account and they'll send you some nice charts they have some really good diabetes uh, inhaler charts all kinds of stuff and then if you want you can always upgrade to the the pro version if you're a pro only if you're a pro only if you're a pro well you should be a pro it you'll... makes you a pro that's <laughs> yeah. what happens yep so yep. upgrade today. <laughs> no, but uh, thank you guys uh, from for from Pearls. Thank you uh, for sponsoring the podcast as always. And so if you haven't checked it out, make sure you go support them. Check out their stuff. If nothing else, get your free chart. Can't hurt you. Nothing bad will happen if you if you check out their app. Let's just put it that way. Nothing bad. Back to you, Cole. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. So that's it for the guanylate cyclase um, stimulants. So there's also prostaglin- uh, prostacycline analogs. Prostacycline analogs, prostanoids. Uh, so with PAH, endogenous PGI2 production is reduced, and so we're going to use an analog to try to help with that. Uh, there's a few. Epiprostanol, which we referenced earlier, right, with mm-hmm. uh, phaser reactive testing. Yep. That's an IV formulation. Ilaprost, which is an inhalation, um, and teprostanil, which is either IV, sub-Q, inhalation, or oral. These are only used for um, functional class 3 and 4. I think most of the others we've talked about so far are for 2, 3, or 4. This is just 3 or 4. So epiprostanol um, is, is an older drug, actually, branded as Flolan. 
um, and, and also Velletri. It's the, it was the first targeted therapy introduced back in 1995, just a little bit after I was born. Uh, like I said, folks, yeah, we get it, Cole. You're young. <laughs> Got to reiterate. Um, really, not so much anymore, though. No, yeah. Well, we're, now we're basically the same age. Yeah. You've caught me. Well, the older we get, the closer you know, the closer in age. Yeah. I don't know if that's how the math works, but we'll check. Well, if we'll you, check after the if show. you think about the relative difference, right? Four mm-hmm. years when you're 10 and 14 are much more significant than when you're 4 and 44. I don't know. I was big for my age, so I don't guess. <laughs> right. That's a lie. Big 14-year-old. Anyways. Um, yeah. So functional class is 3 and 4. It's what it's used for. Um, it's first line for poor prognosis. Given via IV infusion, um, it's a sh- it has a sh- it has a short three to five minute half life. So that's why it's given via continuous IV infusion. Um, there's a risk of catheter and infusion pump related infections. The CDC estimates one infection every three years with epoprostenil and triprostenil IV treatment. Um, yeah, and this is tough because the patient actually has to bring this around, and if they're traveling somewhere, or move, you know, just going and running an error and they have to have this thing with them for the continuous infusion yep. continuous IV infusion and there's a warning on it that says that if you are going to stop this medication you have to basically be weaned off gradually because you get this horrible rebound pulmonary hypertension vasoconstriction if you just stop it abruptly well guess what if your machine suddenly breaks or something like that and you don't have a backup or you don't have you know just whatever you need to fix it three to five minute half life does not give you a very much window um, or a very long window to get help. And a lot of the times these patients can have some pretty negative consequences if something happened to machines. So a lot of the times they'll have like multiple, you know, parts and things that they can use. To, uh, and, uh, That's so nineties, isn't it? Yeah. It's like the same as carrying around a Walkman or a boom box. You don't do that <laughs> on the regular. Is that big one on the shoulder? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. We should bring that back. What is that movie? Say anything. I have no idea. I think that was you a good... You said, what is that movie? It could have been. What is... <laughs> I have no idea. I think uh, I think that was a good reference. It's a movie well, that has a boombox in it, basically? No, it's when he stands outside uh, the girl's window with the boombox. Oh, I don't know. I All haven't right. seen it, but I've heard it referenced so many like times. I feel like you've seen it, Cole. No, I haven't. It's too late. Everyone, laugh, laugh at Cole in the comments section. Oh, I mean, watches it's a... Ch- I think, rom-coms. I think Cole's it's a, a classic. Say anything? Okay, keep going. Anyways, adverse effects, while Cole's looking up this nonsense, um, chest pain, jaw pain, um, GI upset, hypotension, thrombocytopenia have all been kind of reported. And um, it is the the process cycle and analog, though, that does have a documented outcome data that shows that it's, you know, ha- you know basically has proven benefit from a tr- trial standpoint um so yeah it's it's it is available and, and still an option but definitely has its risks um we also have traprostanil um it's got a much longer half-life than epo uh and so it's it's less risk of that vab- uh, rebound vasoconstriction and um, like cole was saying it comes as a sub-q or iv formulation um, primarily and uh the adverse associated with that are going to be more so um, along the injection site pain line and, and infection risk just like with epoprostenol um it's definitely uh, recommended to rotate injection sites yeah um, same class three and four is when it's primarily used and, uh, it's going to have pretty, uh, similar outcomes to epoprostenol as far as like quality of life measurements. Um, and it also has been shown to improve six minute walk distance and hemodynamics overall. Um, but there is a higher risk of, of bloodstream infections, um, compared to, uh, epoprostenol. Yes. So Isoprost is next, but before that, say anything was <laughs> before that was let a me movie go back to released this. in April of 1989. The uh-huh. famous scene, scene of the guy holding the boombox above his head, mm-hmm. playing the song "In Your Eyes" for the girl in the window. That was a great reference. I don't know, dude. I think I feel like that guy was lonely, and I don't want to bring him up in a podcast. I don't know. Ask, now the, ask the ladies from 1989. I bet he was a heartthrob. I don't know, dude. I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's not that. First of all, the ladies from that's my people my age. <laughs> So how dare you? So I guess. Well, you've never seen the movie. Well, that's, yeah. I don't encourage that kind of behavior. <laughs> Write to us if you'd like to say anything. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, Isla Prost, uh, branded as Ventavis. So um, this is the inhalation, and we'll talk about this a little more, but it can be uh, difficult. So it's 2.5 micrograms inhaled six to nine times a day, up to every two hours. Uh, during waking hours um, to a target of five micrograms per dose. So six to nine times a day, the inhalations can take four to 10 minutes. So that's a huge time commitment Mm -hmm. um, for inhalations. Uh, It it improves functional class and six minute walk distance by 10%. Like epiprostanol, it does have a short half-life as well. So patients uh, will need a backup supply 
Um, yeah, we can have the rebound similarly as well. So yeah, we can have the similar rebound. Trey um, also has an inhaled version though, um, which three breaths is the dose. It's basically 18 micrograms four times a day. It's a little bit less intensive as far as, uh, you know, how often you have to take it. Um, and you can do, um, that's kind of how it starts off and then it's titrated over um, a couple weeks and uh, you can have a max of nine breaths four times a day. So a lot of breaths at once it does take less time to actually administer compared to uh, Iloprost, um, but it's more complicated to prepare. So when you factor that in, it's still also going to be quite a time commitment. Yeah, I would I would encourage you to check out these inhalation devices because they're pretty complex. Yeah. Like, we're not talking about an albuterol inhaler yeah, here. Yeah, not even close. We're you not even talking, talking about, about a respamat inhaler. No. This is something like you've never seen, and it looks totally 90s, just like I said. Mm -hmm. Totally it look, 90s. It looks like a nebulizer with a crazy mouthpiece. Yes. I'm trying to think of what else I can compare it to, but that's really the only thing you can. So check them both out. Um, but, yeah, they're yeah, very interesting. So there is also um, an oral therapy in this class, or oral version of triprostanil, kind of like we mentioned. Uh, it's branded as orenitram, um, dosed 0.25 milligrams twice a day or 0.125 milligrams three times a day. Needs to be taken with food. Don't crush it. Um, adverse effects are pretty nonspecific. Headache, nausea, diarrhea, fairly well tolerated. Um, moderate to severe hepatic impairment. Don't use it. There um, is some evidence around it. Improvement of 23 meters in the six-minute walk uh, distance used alone, so as a monotherapy in this instance. Um, two randomized control trials looked at the use of this along with ERAs and or PDE5 inhibitors uh, and did not show benefit for the six-minute walk test. So interestingly, it sounds like this one wouldn't be good to be combined. Yeah, not one that I'm probably uh, going to use. Gonna going to go with. Yeah. Some of the others seem, seem a little better. Yeah. All right. Prostacyclin IP receptor agonist. Another class. Uh, Selexapag is the, the agent in this class, and it's uh, used for functional class two and three. Um, it's a selective agonist of prostacyclin IP receptors, and uh, it basically causes the activation of um, smooth muscle vasodilation and inhibition, inhibition of smooth muscle um, proliferations and platelet aggregation. Um, it's dosed orally twice a day to start in um, 200 micrograms basically twice a day to start, and then you slowly uh, bring that up over a weekly uh, process of titration to get to a max of 1,600 micrograms twice a day. Um, it is recommended taking this with food um, that will help with tolerability. And um, if the patient misses three days or more, in, even if they've been established at the max dose, they have to retitrate the dosing to get back, them back to max dose again. So that's pretty mm. inconvenient. Yes. Um, definitely making sure these patients are staying up to date with their, their refills, which is why they usually use specialty pharmacy. Yeah. So while very annoying for filling my hep C patients at our clinic, good here. I'll, I'll give them that one. <laughs> <laughs> not so much with the hep C ones that drives me crazy. It uh, does have some drug drug interactions with CYP two C eight, not the most common one that we hear about, but definitely some significant interactions there. So there are strong um, CYP two C eight inhibitors like gemfibrozil, canisartan, uh, zafirlucas, clotrimazole, philodipine. Moderate ones would be like oxybutynin, ketoconazole, spironolactone, uh, some statins. Contraindications would be. Um, uh, strong CYP2, 2, 2C8 inhibitors, gemfibrozil, and severe hepatic impairments. That's when you definitely would not want to use it, specifically um, child... Those strong inhibitors are there. Right. Child Pew class uh, C. Yeah. And, the, and if hopefully none of you guys listen to this podcast are using gemfibrozil anymore. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Did, what, did that come up for... Um, no, that wasn't it. For the there was some drug we talked about for clearing um, because of pregnancy. No, uh, that's, that's the that's um, the leflunamide. That's the, uh, the, the for clearing that the rapid excretion or rapid elimination is so when you um, drink cholestyramine. Cholestyramine. Yeah, yeah. bilateral sequestrant. Yeah, never mind. Don't worry, call. I got you. Thank you. No problem. You dude. remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try. Steel um, trap. Every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> that's your brain. Is yeah, yeah, trap? Is, yeah, yeah. I I only forget things that are. Not not related to this. Everything uh, else, yeah, I can't remember where I put my keys. Uh, additionally, if they have moderate hepatic impairment, it's not contraindicated. This would be child pew class B, but started a dose of 200 micrograms once a day. Um, you can find more info in the Griffin trial. Yeah, I like uh, the name of that. Selexipad. Griffin. I like that too. It's a Griffin was it's a very uh, medieval fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very Harry Potter. Yeah, Legend of Zelda, if you will. Okay. 
All right. No, no. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the that's very World of that's Warcraft. Officially, the most. <laughs> you nerdy want me to thing. leave it there? Yeah, yeah. Let's definitely leave it there. For now, we've lost every listener. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's where. You, uh, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the combos. But Celestia Cab being added to um, per, like patients who were previously on other combo therapy, and that third agent seems to be when you use Celestia Cab. Yeah. Celestia Pag is a good option. Yeah. So. All right. So let's put this all together. People like summaries. Sometimes we forget, but here we are yep. doing summaries. We are summarizing. <laughs> Wait for it. It's about to begin. The, uh, so if they're, if they're a candidate for calcium channel blocker based on vasoreactivity testing, great. Do that first until it's no longer effective. If not, like Cole is saying, we're going to jump right into these more advanced therapies. If it's a functional class two patient, um, really two or three, um, we can go combo therapy ideally and the one that has the best data associated with it is ambrocytin and tadalafil that combo um it seems to be the one it's, it's specifically from the ambition trial and um, showed that that initial uh, initial combination was associated with a significant reduction time to clinical failure as well as ph hospitalizations so that 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 combo is specifically the one to use ideally now some other options there is some data with um Malcentinin, uh, mal mal all of a sudden I can't pronounce words, plus sildenafil. That one does have some, some data associated with it. It's just not quite as good of, of quality data, um, specifically those done in patients with functional class 2 and 3. Um, but ideally, again, combo therapy is uh, first line if possible. If they do not want to use combo therapy, the patient's only willing to take one med or you know, maybe they can't tolerate two, whatever the case may be, then you really have kind of a wider range of, of medications. Specifically in functional class two, um, any of the ERAs or PDE5 inhibitors are okay to use monotherapy. And if it's monotherapy and you're only going to use, uh, or you have functional class three patient and you only are going to use monotherapy, then try to use the inhaled or parenteral prostacycline analogs. Yeah. Um, the combo therapy therapy can kind of bypass that because of the two meds. But if you are only going to use um, the one and it's functional class three specifically, bump that up to the, the IV or inhaled. Right. High risk patients. So basically functional class four, uh, there's the some new evidence showing that there is some even additional benefit by starting three drug combo uh, and instead of two. So uh, bosetin, sildenafil, and IV epoprostanol combo would be the preferred three drug combo that has some data um, that's been uh, published not too long ago. Um, and if that's not possible and you have to go two drugs, there is a whole slew of, of potential options. The ones that I'm listing here are just based on the best kind of quality of evidence and, and data, just to give you some that have have evidence to support their use. Um, Bosetin and IV epoprostanol would be one. Um, Melcetin and sub-Q triprostanil is another one. And then sildenafil plus sub-Q triprostanil is the third. Um, like I said, there's others, but those have seemingly the best quality of evidence compared to some of the others that are available. Yep. And then you want to follow up. So you assess the risk again at three to six months. If they're low risk, you can continue what you're on, do a structured follow-up every three to six months. If they're after, after that point or after the first three to six months, they're at intermediate or high risk, then you may want to adjust therapy. So if they're taking um, an ERA and a PDE5 inhibitor at this point, the recommendation would be to add Selexapag. Uh, for patients on Bocenta and monotherapy, there's a few options you can add. You can add Riosigwat, add Tadalafil, add inhaled uh, tripoprostanil, or add inhale, inhaled iloprost. Uh, if the patients are currently on monotherapy of IV epoprostanil, you can add sildenafil to that. Again, follow up in three to six months. Of, uh, three, three to six months after that, maximize their medical therapy, um, and then they would probably need to go on the list for a lung transplant as well. And, and also going back to those those kind of combos that uh, Cole had, was talking about, those again are there's several others as well. But those that he mentioned do have solid, you know, and better quality data compared to others. And for example, um, we use both sent in monotherapy in that case, and then what you can add to that. Because, like Cole said initially, like that's one that you're going to see more commonly. It's been around longer, so um, from from an evidence standpoint, we do have more to work with. So there's plenty of other options for those of you who have like the Depiros um, 
pharmacotherapy textbook, check out the uh, PH section because um, the, especially the new edition, the newest one that I believe is just this chapter is only uh, on, uh, available through um, electronic uses. But uh, if you go on there and, and look at that, they have a list of this extensive, um, you know, compilation of all the data that they have now and the quality of evidence and the functional groups associated with it. And you, you can kind of see there's a whole bunch of options to pick from. So we tried to pick some that were somewhat simple based on what kind of evidence that are, is available instead of just picking and choosing randomly. Right. Cool. So, cool. Um, yeah. Check that stuff out. Um, I think that's all we got for this. I think it is. We did it, Cole. We got through it. Good job. Yeah, that's a, that's look, a specialized yeah, one right there. Look at us. I know. We've done a lot of topics that would be considered a little more specialized. Yeah, we? We probably didn't do a good job at them, but we did them. <laughs> Just goes to show you, what if happened you to... have your own microphone, you can really tackle anything. <laughs> you really can. We used to bring on guests for these things. But... Yeah, but now we just don't have anybody willing to be our guest. I know. I know. I need to ask some people. Yeah, I would. We do. I'd love to get a uh, pulmonologist on here to talk more in depth about some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We'll, okay, if anybody knows him, send him our way. We'll set, we'll set it up. Our emails will be in the, well, you guys will be the, you know, obviously the starting point, and then we'll set it up. So we're going to do as little work as possible. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we all set it up. Yeah. We'll, email show, us, we'll when, show up. Email us when they show up. Um, but, uh, yeah, our emails will be in the show notes, so feel free to pass those along. And, um, you know, we'll be happy to talk to you guys over email. If you can um, reach us on any of the social media platforms, that's fine as well. Um, you can send us a text directly at uh, four. One five nine four three six one one six. You get like an automatic response. You don't feel free to ignore that if you want, and I'll get back to you in there as quick as I can. Um, I try to keep up with those, but I do. I'm sure I missed some here and there. So if I haven't responded, I apologize. Um, and then uh, if you want more traditional style lectures, PowerPoint slides, things like that, um, check out Patreon. So it's www.patreon.com slash core consult RX. And uh, that's got a lot more, uh, like I said, traditional style lecture where we don't go off on these tangents and all this stuff. They're more boring in my opinion. But hey, for those of you who like that kind of thing. Better um, for learning maybe for maybe, some people. Yeah. There maybe you not go. all people. Maybe not all people, but some of you may like them better. So we've definitely gotten some good feedback on those. So I appreciate everyone who's definitely uh, already signed up and been utilizing that service. That helps us out a lot. And uh, for those of you watching the video version, make sure you hit that like and subscribe because, you know, that's what you're supposed to say at the end of YouTube videos. Um, but, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, Pearls. Thank you, FreeCE.com. Make sure you go to their website now. And uh, if you're an unlimited member, use that password, P U L M H T N, all caps. Unlock the password, crush the, pa the 10 question quiz, and get your credit. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.